Can you hear me now? Yeah? Okay. So I think it's time to start a new session. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to this exciting session, which is called Getting Fit for 55. My name is uh, Eva Baños de Guisasola, and I work for CMR and Platforma as advisor on sustainable development goals, global agendas, and climate. So I'm going to be the moderator for this session, which will run from now until one o'clock. And before we go into the content of the session, I'm going to give you some practical um, details. This session is being recorded. Um, we will be taking a group picture at the very end, so please turn your cameras at the end. Then also, if you want to intervene, there is the question and answers chat. Where you will have a moment as well for questions and answers. So put them in the chat. Um, and then without any further delays, I would like to get into the session. Um, this is a session that follows the ceremony of the Covenant of Mayors uh, this morning. I think that many of you have been following that. Just in case some of you have uh, missed it, um, I will just really recap uh, very briefly. It was uh, an exciting uh, introduction by the President of the Parliament, uh, by Mr. Sassoli, also by the Commissioner uh, Catherine Simpson, also by the President of the Committee of the Regions. They all really reinforced the need to keep involving cities um, in the fight against climate change and also adaptation to climate change. They also recall the necessity to deal with the climate emergency in which we are now. We also saw that the pandemic that we have lived recently has uh, put us in a very difficult situation, mainly at the local level, but that has also shown big opportunities for really making uh, our cities more resilient. So we are really leading on the example. We have seen that Europe is, a, is the leading continent. And now with the new uh, objectives that we have to become carbon neutral by 250, this is a huge opportunity for the local uh, community to show an example, to lead an example, and also by doing this, we will also assist member states to contribute to reaching the Paris Agreement. Then we have also seen some very concrete examples for pioneering cities that are really committing to the uh, Covenant of Mayors, and we have seen examples from Tampere, Grobo, Prague, Turku, Stockholm, uh, Grenoble, uh, Murcia, Padova. These are all cities that in one way or another they are not only fighting and adapting to climate change, but are really committing and to the targets and objectives of the Covenant of Mayors and really are aligned towards the uh, overall objective of uh, the carbonizing societies by 250. And as you know, recently, the EU has adopted a very ambitious target of reducing CO2 emissions of 50%, 55% by year 2030. And this is the new commitment that has been renewed within the global uh, community of the Covenant of Mayors. And just as a short recap, uh, the Covenant of Mayors, as you know, started in 2008. And then through the years, we have been added the an adaptation dimension in 2014. In 2015, there was the new engagement for a new commitment to be more ambitious and reaching 40% by 2030. And now with the overall EU goal of 55% by year 2030, cities really want to be in that uh, um, direction. And they're really now showing new commitments. And this morning session really proved that is real and is happening. So, and, and as you know, the uh, Covenant of Mayors has three steps. So it's the um, commitment, the formal commitment by the uh, politician, then the production of an action plan on energy and adaptation, and then the monitoring and review of the progress. So this is in a nutshell, the Covenant of Mayors, as you all know as well, the Covenant is part of the global Covenant of Mayors community with regions all around the world. And the community currently has more than 10,000, and it will really get into 11,000 cities engaged here, covering more than 330 million citizens. So this is really the clear example where the local level can make a difference. And the networking that we have created in the Covenant of Mayors is really a clear example where we can see that things are happening and that real. 
So without further um, introduction on this, uh, I'll present the program. We're going to have two um, speakers from the Commission. Uh, our colleague Edo Eli, advisor in um, DG Ener, is going to tell us about the FIT55 package, why this is important. It's a package that was adopted in July to really comply with this new ambitious target. And then our colleague uh, Matthew Batwen, uh, manager on Climate Neutral and Smart Cities Mission, uh, Deputy Director of DG Mood, will tell us about the Climate Neutral and Smart Cities Mission, which also has a very ambitious target for 2030. Then we will have a bit of time for uh, quick reactions to these two speakers, and then we will present two cases from two cities, the city of Aachen and the city of Slazomowski, um, where they will present us what are their commitments. And finally, we'll have uh, more time for questions and answers, and that's where I encourage you to really use the chat box. And as I put in the slide in the, that you can see, there are hashtags that I encourage you to um, use. Uh, to promote your activities and to disseminate the practices that you're involved in. So without further delay, I will pass the floor to my colleague Ero. Ero, you have the floor. Thank you. Yes, very good morning to, to all of you. It's very sunny in Brussels. I hope also in your, in your city, wherever you are. Uh, it's a great pleasure to enter a topic of uh, uh, the Fit for 55 package here. Uh, it's a, indeed an enormous legislative package that we uh, have uh, just um, um, published. And how do I change the slide now? I don't, I don't get these slides going. Does it work now? Okay, very good. We, we got the technology working. So uh, what's behind this uh, Fit 55 package? Actually, there is the so-called climate target plan. And that was a roadmap uh, the commission published last year, and uh, this was really looking at how to make us reach this climate neutrality by uh, 2050. And to do that, we need to uh, go through uh, an interim step, which is indeed 2030, uh, by which time we want to have over half of the greenhouse gas emissions uh, cut uh, compared to where we stand. And uh, the plan showed that this is actually totally feasible to, uh, to achieve this change. But uh, what we need to do is that uh, um, uh, all the sectors will have to chip in um, uh, more hard than, uh, than in the past so that we can be on the right uh, path towards this uh, climate neutrality goal. And on the right, you see a graph and this shows colors in bars in the different sectors. And, and there the blue ones are the ones where showing what investment in these different areas has already been made and uh, in the last decade. And then the gray ones are what we had been uh, committed to by uh, so far, by 2030. And then the green bit is the extra, the, uh, what we need to get to um, 20, uh, uh, to the 55 target. And this spider web here shows the, um, uh, all these different uh, um, legal uh, proposals that the Commission has made. They range from climate to transport, to energy and, uh, and taxation, and all of them are interconnected. And, and the uh, overall goal here is, of course, to send a message to the uh, COP conference in Glasgow that the EU is serious about the uh, green and digital transition and, and follows the uh, public opinion on, on that as well. And to do that smartly, we want to do it in a fair, cost-efficient and competitive way which then creates jobs also for the young generation in particular. Now, here's an overall a picture on the, uh, this set of uh, uh, 12 uh, proposals. We've categorized them here in according to um, pricing targets, rules, and, and, and support measures. So in the pricing category, you have uh, indeed the em emission trading system, which has been extended now to aviation. 
and, uh, and, and maritime or transport and buildings. And then you have the energy taxation directive, of course, and uh, the carbon adjustment mechanism that I will mention about later. Then we need to set targets because those focus action, that's in the central column. Uh, we have their effort sharing. We have uh, land use related uh, legislation. We have renewable energy and of course, energy efficiency directives there. And then when it comes to the market rules, so uh, there we are um, uh, including vehicle emission standards uh, and uh, then um, new infrastructure regulation for alternative fuels uh, like uh, electric vehicle charging, for instance. And then indeed, uh, there are uh, fuel emission legislation concerning maritime and aviation uh, sector. And then all of this, to make it happen, obviously, we need to support that type of activity. And there's a big, uh, important uh, uh, newcomer uh, to the toolbox, which is the Social Climate Fund. And this indeed aims at supporting the transition, particularly the more vulnerable uh, uh, consumers, energy poor, and those who might uh, have uh, uh, increases in their uh, fuel prices, for instance. And then in addition to that, modernization fund and innovation fund are going to be enhanced uh, to bring that, um, uh, bring the uh, resources. Then let me present you some of the proposals in this. We start with the emission trading system. This is basically uh, doing what you all know about uh, polluter pace principle. Well, here it's going to be the emitter pace principle. So uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions um, are going to have a, uh, we will put a price on them. And uh, the uh, system, the ETS system has uh, worked very well already uh, uh, so far. However, now it needs to be updated. And uh, uh, indeed, it puts a price on polluting fuels and encouraging producers to innovate and invest in clean energy and, and give solutions for us end users. And uh, I mentioned already the social fund, uh, it's, it's part of the novelties in this. And then another one is that we are ensuring actually a level playing field for all heating options. And, and this, is, this means like complementing the existing carbon price, which is on electric heating and district heating, so there's going to be a similar thing on domestic heating. So we are enlarging the scope. And then obviously this mechanism will create the revenues for the member states to support the decarbonization of buildings among other things. Now, we go further to the energy, uh, renewable energy directive. And uh, obviously uh, what we're doing here is we are increasing investment uh, and deployment of renewable energy. And today we're at 34% of electricity coming from uh, renewable energy. And now the next uh, uh, goal is then to get that up to 40%. And this is a binding target by 40% by 2030. And uh, all member states will be contributing to this. Uh, and there are these kinds of sub targets on in heating and cooling transport industry buildings, uh, which are increasing investment in these areas. And we are also making sure that the biomass, bioenergy uh, um, sustainability is ensured by um, uh, updating the criteria to that. And one point on cities, so I think there was a, uh, also, there's a reference, an example, uh, where member states are invited to provide capacity building for local authorities in the planning and implementation of renewable projects. So that's uh, the role of uh, um, them is uh, ensured here. Now, uh, then to the energy efficiency directive, uh, which is a key one for, uh, for cities as well, uh, in particular, I would say. And uh, here we have the, um, uh, these kinds of indicative uh, contributions by each member state to the energy efficiency target at EU level. And what is that target? Well, it is the new target will be 36 to 39% of uh, um, uh, energy savings. Uh, depending on the if it's if we talk final or primary energy consumption, and uh, the whole logic here is to uh, reduce overall energy use, cut emissions, and tackle energy poverty. And uh, uh, then there is going to be a, a guidance to uh, how these national contributions are set, and and basically pretty much doubling these uh, saving obligations for each of the member states. And uh, public sector has specific. Uh, 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 expectations here in terms of renovation because uh, of uh, accelerating the renovation 
campaign that you uh, will have heard of, but uh, probably, and then create the jobs uh, uh, in that sector, because all of this is, of course, paid. Uh, the beginning is paid by taxpayers, so we want to make sure that it's uh, job creation is in the center of it. And the energy efficiency first principle will be uh, uh, enshrined in law. Now, uh, about this directive uh, and cities, there are a lot of connections. There is the uh, primary one is this 3% of uh, public buildings to be renovated uh, each year. And that includes also uh, local authorities and regional authorities. And, and the second important point is public procurement. So now it's time really to get those uh, energy efficiency requirements in the public procurement. When you are procuring products or services or buildings, uh, you, the mayors and, and uh, uh, practitioners, you are in the key position here. Um, the local authorities are also expected to introduce energy efficiency in their de decarbonization plans, pretty obvious. And then uh, the member states will help you uh, in uh, guidance, in boosting competence building, training, and also things like uh, cooperation about uh, public authorities in this area. And there's a special emphasis actually here on local energy agencies, which are really key players in getting things done. And uh, very interestingly, there is a direct reference also to the Covenant of Mayors uh, using the initiatives of Covenant of Mayors. So your uh, initiatives actually in this, uh, in this context. And uh, heating and cooling is, is strengthened as well. So for municipalities with more than 50,000 inhabitants, there's a re uh, requirement to prepare these kinds of heating cooling plans. And um, then there are very, very of support activities like information, the multi-level dialogue, energy poverty and, and competence centers and, and, and things like that to help this work at local level. And last but certainly not least, there's a strong requirement uh, for the member states message that you need to give a hand to the regional local authorities as much as you can to help them in financing and technical support. And of course, the European Commission is going to do the same through its means. So now, uh, uh, what about public, uh, about transport? The, uh, tra in transport, there's been uh, less than 10% of renewables in 2019, and this needs to double, actually. So what we're doing is um, we're bringing here stronger uh, emission standards for, uh, for vehicles. So it means 55% cut uh, um, uh, from uh, 2030 onwards compared to today. And uh, from 2035, all new vehicles will be zero emission. So 2035, that's a big step. And then we have to, of course, help uh, uh, the uh, drivers in, in fueling their vehicles. And that's why the alternative fuel infrastructure regulation will, um, uh, will uh, foresee that uh, there are going to be recharging points every 60 kilometers for electric charging and, and every 150 kilometers for hydrogen refueling so that it really can be done. And again, cities, uh, I mean, member states are uh, uh, invited to take uh, well into uh, in account of their your interests in, in setting up this kind of a recharging network. And uh, just briefly about uh, this uh, land use and land use change on forestry, maybe not so relevant for cities, just to say that it's an, uh, a piece of legislation which um, sets uh, targets for carbon removals, uh, removals by natural sinks. And then there is the easy uh, effort sharing regulation. This is something that uh, where we will be setting a bit stronger targets for emission reduction in the areas uh, which you see on the slide, transport buildings and, and all of that. And that's complementing the, the work that the emission trading system is doing on, on prices. Um, now, the last point here is then taxation and trade. So here we have our energy taxation directive. The goal is clear. Let's get tax incentives away from fossil to clean, clean technologies. And, uh, and then also let's try to remove this kind of harmful tax competition uh, uh, between the member states so that uh, countries will have uh, will be able to rely on green taxes more than taxing labor uh, in, in this, in this um, uh, transition. The carbon board adjust, adjustment mechanism is actually 
a method of uh, uh, avoiding that uh, out, uh, countries outside Europe would be uh, profiting on the, at the expense of European companies uh, uh, from a, um, a difference in, in the ambition level on, on, on uh, uh, climate, climate change uh, fight. So that the avoidance of carbon leakage, that's the technical term for this. Now, what about cities and fit for 55? Well, now, what about the cities? Yeah. Exactly. Uh, this is finally the, uh, the, the key point. Well, um, here you see, the commission will continue this complementarity of top down and bottom up, bottom up action. So the fit for 55 and all the other legislation, which is there, what does it do? It gives the targets, it acknowledges the role of, of the, of you cities. It gives empowerment to act in, in new areas and defines the rules of the game. And, uh, and this is what comes from there towards the Kavanaugh mayors and uh, European cities in, in, in general. On the other hand, then the covenant has shown its strength in doing the trailblazing, showing to the member states that look, these things can be done, be it local energy communities or, or whatnot. And uh, the cities, you will be also giving us policy feedback on what works, you know, reality checking. And you will, uh, you are the ones who have the network you have the close contact to the uh, citizens, so you know best what works and what doesn't, particularly when we need to think of uh, behavioral changes. And uh, uh, about when you look at this slide where you have uh, the activity areas of covenant cities uh, aiming at carbon neutrality, climate neutrality, so you see that pretty much all these action areas of cities they are one or uh, in one or on, uh, other way covered in the 55 legislation. So you are going to be in the in the center of this, particularly as we move from lawmaking into implementation. So role of the covenant, role of the cities is going to be increasing all the time. And uh, it's clear that you are the ones who are leading on citizen engagement, local acceptance, you know, uptake of new opportunities that the uh, that the law gives because you have this political commitment uh, as part of the covenant commitment. And that's like a really key point. But now covenant will not be alone on this. There are many like-minded initiatives uh, such as the Smart Cities Marketplace, there's the Energy Poverty Advisory Hub, and uh, last but certainly not least, the uh, Mission for 100 Climate Neutral and Smart Cities, which has just been launched uh, and this, these are bringing innovative solutions, support, and uh, other, other, other help to covenant signatories in their work. And uh, it's going to be my great pleasure then to soon give the hand, give the, uh, the floor to um, the next speaker, Matthew Baldwin, who will be then uh, developing on the um, connection between the, uh, the, the uh, uh, climate neutral um, uh, cities mission and, and, and the covenant. Thank you very much. Many thanks, uh, Edo. I've noted uh, three very relevant questions, so we'll wait until Matthew has presented his part, and then we'll come back to a, a shorter moment for questions and answers, so we can address them to both of uh, you. Okay, so thanks very much. So, uh, Matthew, you have the floor. Thank you. My second failure to unmute of the day, they mount up during the course. So it's wonderful to be with you all. Thank you, Ava. Thank you, Eero, for that wonderful presentation. And, and thank you for setting out so well what we are doing uh, in the European Union to drive towards the climate neutral continent that we know we have to be by 2050. And of course, in the meantime, we have to make this crucial intermediate step, fit for 55 by 2030. What an exciting challenge. You set that out brilliantly. And if I may, it's lovely to be back in the context of the Covenant of the Mayors. Um, Ava, you mentioned at the start, uh, uh, you began in 2008, and I attended, I think, one of the first events when I was working with President Jose Manuel Barroso uh, in the hemicycle of the European Parliament. And the excitement that day was literally pulsing with all the mayors coming together, determined to make what were then the first steps towards action in this uh, in this crucial area and so exciting for me to come back into this field and to hear what you're doing and how you've in fact upped your levels of ambition 
now you're explicitly talking about climate neutrality uh, and that's very exciting and i want to come along today to explain how i hope we can add value to that in a very complementary way with the covenant of the mayors um, and explain why the european union needs yet another initiative on cities and climate neutrality next slide please well, to this audience, I really don't think why I need to say why cities matter, but let's remind ourselves 75% of us live in cities, 85% by 2050 on just 4% of uh, EU's land mass and more than 65% of our energy consumption, more than 70% of global CO2 emissions flow from our cities. And of course, it's not just these terrible invisible greenhouse gas gases that are threatening our very existence. With those gases come a stack of other problems, air and noise pollution, congestion, dangerous roads. And if therefore we can flip that logic on its head and start to address uh, greenhouse gases in a systematic way across the cities, we bring incredible co-benefits with it. And on the energy side, the era we were discussing the other day, uh, uh, climate, uh, 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 we, we, we can uh, get lower energy bills, we can get energy security if we can, if we can act in the right ways. And, and why cities? Because both of the covenant of the mayors and what we're trying to do, it's the European Green Deal at local level, if you like, the crossroads where policy meet people. And as you've just heard, uh, as you've been hearing all this morning, cities have that ambition to go further. Uh, cities are these concentrated centers of uh, economic and political power, um, the vanguard, the focused centers of research and innovation, uh, embodied innovation, if you will. Um, but um, despite everything that's going on thus far, it's very interesting, again, we were discussing this era the other day, relatively few cities thus far have declared their readiness to be climate neutral by 2030, to go all the way. And I think we know the reasons why. It's an incredible challenge to do that. It's costly. That last 20, 30% of emissions uh, has, it comes with a high marginal cost. We start to get into individual behaviors of our citizens. It's more difficult. It's more complicated, which is why the European Commission last week decided to launch a new mission to have, a next slide please, with a roll of drums, twin objectives at least 100 climate neutral and smart European cities by 2030, building on the work that the Covenant of Mayors has done and is doing and working in close partnership with the Covenant of Mayors, but also looking at the process of how a city becomes climate neutral, ensuring that these cities can act as experimentation and innovation hubs so that all cities can be in a position to be climate neutral by 2050. And I don't need to explain why, we've all got to be there by 2050 cities can get there further and faster. Next slide, please. But if you're a city out there, and we're going to hear from a couple of great cities in just a moment, I'm sure you're asking yourself, well, what's the value added for us? We're already participating in the covenant of the mayors. We've uh, upped our ambition levels. Um, we're doing uh, everything we can. What I want to do in the last five minutes or so is just map out for you some of the additional benefits if you Keep going with the Covenant of the Mayors, but you're ready to step across and also join us in the city's mission. And I will just very quickly uh, walk through um, some of those areas. I don't think I have time to go through all of them, but uh, next slide, please. And let me go through how we're going to do this. First and foremost, um, uh, I should have had a slide setting out the timetable nice and neatly for you, but I failed on that. We'll be sending an info kit out to all cities that are interested. It'll be published on our website. This will provide some detailed uh, uh, um, information on the timetable we envisage. The first step will be a call for expression of interest from cities, and we're expecting to launch that in mid-November. So the info kit will come around in mid-October. This will provide you with the kinds of areas we're looking for, plus we hope some very good, I would say, quite detailed technical information for cities are thinking about the challenges of climate neutrality in all the different areas, such as energy efficiency, urban mobility, and so on. So this call for expression of interest is not a commitment from cities. It is where you say, this sounds interesting. We think we can do this. It needs a political engagement. Um, and we're ready to start working, if chosen, on what we call these climate city contracts. But to help you along this way, 
we were going to set up a mission platform, uh, which is run by the Net Zero Cities Consortium, who've just started work. You can see these slides are already out of date. They started their work on the 1st of October. It's led by uh, EIT Climate Kick, which many of you will know already. They've been doing some great work with cities. But we have a host of other organizations committed to climate neutrality, such as Eclair, Euro Cities, and I think there are 35 different players in this consortium. And we're funding them under a, a call under Horizon 2020, and we will bring out subsequent iterations of the mission platform as the program gathers uh, pace. But it is these climate city contracts that we will create together with cities, with your citizens, with your stakeholders, with local and regional and national authorities. Um, and this is where, if you like, the city says, okay, this is how we're going to do it. We thought about it. We have with the help of the mission platform, constructed these tailor-made investment plans based on detailed uh, project and program preparation and detailed financial advice. And yes, we're going to also participate in these RNI pilots and deep demonstrators, and the mission platform will be responsible for taking those forward. I think the mission platform has a huge capacity to be a great helping hand for cities who are engaging in this extra step to be climate neutral by 2030. Next uh, slide, please. And so here's a quick uh, look at these climate city contracts in a slightly more detail. I've mentioned the tailor-made plans and how it will be worked with support of the mission platform. Key point, when we ask cities to sign these contracts, they're non-legally binding. It's the memorandum of understanding we're looking for. We're not going to be taking cities to court if you fail to deliver on climate neutrality by 2030 or reclaim funds or anything like that. Um, but again, we see these contracts as a central tool which we work on together um, uh, to, to, to deliver on this great ambition. And one thing I haven't mentioned up to now, the need to innovate across the board, which is why we're rooted in the Horizon Europe program, but also on innovative city governance, a holistic approach looking across the piece at how we deliver climate neutrality, whether it's in energy, whether it's in urban mobility or in waste and water management, the whole circular economy. your microphone testing i'm back sorry we had a brief technical difficulty there um i uh, hope you had time to make yourself a cup of coffee um but i'm back live with you next slide please yes um, i mentioned that we run out of horizon uh, europe this is a brief look at how rni content is going to directly support your city in achieving this mission um there will be specific calls aimed at uh, helping cities uh, deliver this, such as on positive energy districts, such as on public transport, and then we'll be specifically again within the mission platform producing, uh, delivering new calls uh, through that as well. And again, the goal is to develop the capacity and showcase how cities can scale up and replicate these, these efforts. Um, the last point is very important. We are not trying to be we are a new kid on the block. We are not planning to be the only kid on the block. We really want to work closely with the Covenant of the Mayors, with the Climate Pact, with the Zero Pollution Action Gang over at DG Environment, um, with the Living in the EU and the Smart Cities Marketplace. The list goes on, but we are planning to join up so that cities, uh, you can use these initiatives um, and, and gain benefit thereby. Next slide, please. Well, this is a key element of the value added, because if we look at the funding and financing required for cities, it's going to be enormous. Um, just to let you into a little dirty secret, there isn't going to be enough money in the EU budget, all the national budgets, all the city budgets. We're going to kick in around 300 million in the first three years from the Horizon Europe. Um, and we're very much hoping that, uh, uh, I flashed it on the screen earlier, with the mission label, cities will have um, enhanced access to structural funds, to funds flowing from the Recovery and Resilience Fund, um, uh, um, 
all different kinds of EU programs, the CEF and so on. But we know that cities are going to need very targeted and specific advice as to how to reach out to get that additional funding and financing. So we're planning detailed cooperation with the European Investment Bank. We're ready to put some money from the mission into uh, the financial advisory capacity there, looking at possibly a blending facility, working with the EIB and others to develop green bonds and other means for cities to raise money on, uh, on private capital markets. But it's a very interesting exercise if you look at the cities that are planning to do this already, like Leuven, just down the road, who've done tremendous work at working with uh, private investors, including locally, the local banks, um, but also national and regional promotional banks. Um, we're really confident that the new EU sustainable finance agenda is going to offer huge new opportunities to encourage investors to invest locally. Just anecdotally, Eero, um, the other day I was talking to one of these masters of the universe, super finance guys in New York, who advises high net worth individuals on how they can plan their portfolios. And they're no longer looking at ways to reduce their carbon footprint. They want climate neutral portfolios. So there's a whole wash of money out there which is floating. And I think we in the covenant, we in the new mission need to find ways of capturing that and working closely with these finance guys and these capital instruments guys. Next slide, please. Well, I should stop because I really want to hear from the cities and I see we're running quite late on time. Here's how to get in touch with, with us. Uh, that's our, uh, our mailbox. There's our web page. On that web page, you'll find already our implementation plans. You'll find the info pack when that becomes available. And of course, all references to the call for expression of interest in mid-November. I really want to stress how much we want to work with you on this. If you haven't thought about it yet, now is a great moment to start thinking. Get in touch with us if you have any questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thanks, Emilian. and uh, Matthew. Very exciting. He's next to me here. So I get very excited. yeah, it, it is a, it is an exciting um, challenge. So thanks for for these uh, really very clear um, presentations. I've been uh, looking at the chat, so I would like to before I give the floor to the next uh, speakers, I would like to quickly give an opportunity for the audience to reflect on this. So I have three questions for Edo and a couple for Matthew. So I will just uh, present them to you in one block and then uh, Edo, you can give a... a so can you hear me now well? Okay, I don't know whether you've not heard me before. So I will say it again that I want to give the opportunity to the audience to reflect on uh, the two presentations were made. I've got three questions for Edo and two for Matthew. Edo, the first one is from a colleague from Essen, is how will this 3% be enforced? And if uh, member states are responsible towards the um, commission, uh, if the local authorities cannot fulfill this 3%, uh, our colleague uh, Kai Lipsius is when this social climate fund will start funding. And our colleague from Barcelona is, uh, is it expected to be any kind of resilience funds to develop and implement adaptation to climate change measures. These are the ones for you, Ero, and the ones for you, Matthew, is how a small cities part of the Covenant of Mayors um, can benefit from the mission at what stage? Um, and the second one is, are climate city contracts uh, among stakeholders in the cities or between cities and um, zero net zero cities or both? and um, how stakeholders in the city should commit. So you can maybe give uh, feedback on, on these two points. So Edo, you, please. I should be unmuted, is that the case? Yeah, very good. So uh, thank you, Kai. Indeed, I uh, started writing already uh, in the chat, but on this 3% uh, uh, renovation requirement. So it's a, uh, uh, quite a classical um, uh, the, the enforcement in the sense that indeed it's, it is the, uh, the member states who are uh, ultimately always uh, responsible towards the, um, uh, towards the, uh, uh, the commission and, uh, and at the end also the court of justice. So uh, they will, um, they are the counterpart, but obviously they will then be um, organizing this um, in the, internally inside the, inside the member state. So I will be enforcing it nationally in, in that sense. And uh, uh, the enforcement follows these kinds of um, uh, tools that uh, the uh, uh, EU foresees, which are 
we start with transposition checks of legislation when we set up the indeed uh, directives we publish them so we will check that each member state transposes them into national law and then we will look at uh, that it's transposed correctly so there are the right things uh, in a, uh, written in there and that's uh, sort of like a content check which is happening so that's that is the, what, what the commission does and if we then find problems so we will then uh, uh, interact with the member state we said we ask question how come this how come that why haven't you done this and then if things uh, do not get sold uh, uh, so then at some point there might be then the next step going towards more formal um, uh, steps uh, where we start uh, involving the, the court of justice in, in that but okay that's then the the, the uh, uh, latter latter part if things go badly and about the climate social fund so this is now indeed it's a it's a proposal we made it in in july and what's happening now is that um, the European Parliament and the Council, so they are working on that. They are uh, they are discussing this, and then we will uh, the the uh, really use of that will actually depend now on the schedule that uh, uh, um, the legislative process will take. So uh, I would I would expect this to certainly this kind of process usually takes a year uh, or, or so, and uh, um, it depends on how the member state which is always holding the presidency like Slovenia now how they prioritize things so which part goes first which which next so uh, unfortunately I cannot give you an answer but uh, it, it it won't happen tomorrow so uh, the, uh, it'll, it'll certainly take uh, take some uh, uh, take some time like I said so at least at least a year before we can kick it off that's the uh, that's that and then there was a question about the resilience um, well, there's going to be actually a, a, a small uh, small part of that is, is, is going to happen even through the covenant of mayors. Indeed, we have uh, some work underway on a so-called policy uh, policy facility where we'll be doing through the covenant of mayors some work which is focusing indeed on resilience, helping the adaptation and helping your work on uh, on, on that. Uh, but then, uh, uh, indeed, from the um, uh, the EU budget and, and also the uh, recovery um, and resilience uh, addition to the budget. Um, so there are going to be uh, funds allocated also for resilience work. So not necessarily as name, uh, like calling it the resilience fund, but, uh, 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 but more, more generally to adaptation. And if I am not wrong, here I might be guessing a little bit, but uh, I remember that in the modernization fund, uh, there were some aspects of this direction, but don't quote me on this one. So I uh, hope I don't get it wrong. Thanks. Okay, thanks a million, Ed. So Matthew, up to you. Interesting, the sound again. I see it's tricky. You can hear me? Very good. No, thanks uh, for those uh, really good questions. Um, I don't know who the first one was from, unfortunately, but it's about how can small cities benefit and 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 how can learn from the experience of the city's mission um i didn't go through all the detailed criteria we are setting but we are essentially setting the threshold at cities of 50,000 people or above we have a complex mechanism for trying to ensure that the city uh, city mission covers cities from all uh, member states across the european union which is for the smaller member states if you if you don't have that many bigger cities we're ready to let in cities between 10,000 and 50,000. Um, this way, I think, I hope we will have a mixture of the smaller cities all the way up to, I hope, one or two of the mega cities of Europe, because we need to test and understand this concept of climate neutrality of cities of different sizes, of different levels of preparation. And this mission must look like Europe. It can't just be you know what I mean by the usual suspects to the north and the west of the Europe from your home country of uh, Finland era, for example, it's got to come from all over and some of the most exciting. Um, uh, the, the, the most exciting uh, uh, impulses I've received are so often from South and Eastern Europe because they know they have often a long way, a lot to do to catch up. If your city, whoever asked that question, falls outside that threshold, don't give up. Firstly, stay engaged in the covenant of mayors, and we will hope that the learning experiences from the city mission percolate also through the covenant of the mayors. We will also have, because we may have more cities 
the, the 100 wanting to engage with us, we're not planning to say no to anybody. We're going to try to have platform-based learning, uh, 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 twinning experiences on different aspects of this, um, and to making sure that it's a bit like climbing a mountain, that the first climbers that go up prepare the ground for everyone that's coming behind, big or small. Um, Kai, your question on uh, climate uh, city contracts. Um, uh, I, I agree we're floating a new concept here, so let me take a moment just to unpack it a bit. Um, contract means different things to different people. To some people, it might mean something that's legally binding. To other people, it might have a sort of commercial connotation. In fact, we mean neither. It's a, it's a snappy title that we inherited from the mission board who put together the original original Horizon uh, Europe uh, idea for 100 climate neutral cities. And the idea is to capture the political commitment of the, of the mayor or the mayoress or the governing body of the city uh, involved. Um, so we're looking for the cities to sign that contract. And we reckon it's gonna take some time to put together. I think the first cities ready, won't be ready totally till the end of uh, 22 probably. But they need to do so on the basis of working on this contract. It follows naturally, I'm sure, for cities who think about this, with their citizens. Citizens' engagement is going to be crucial throughout this. All local stakeholders, the local businesses, and also with the national authorities. We're pushing national authorities to create networks of climate neutral cities. Uh, mutual support, I hope, some funding, also at the regional level. So. Um, your question about how stakeholders commit, we hope stakeholders will be part of a very vital and engaging process led by the cities themselves uh, of citizens engagement to build these contracts. This won't work if citizens think this is something which is being done to them rather than with them and for them. And that's the goal. But you won't get, you won't hear Brussels telling the cities how to do that. You know, we're not the long wagging finger. We don't know how uh, citizens engagement works in your city, whether it's in, in Turku or whether it's in, um, uh, uh, in, in Bucharest. Cities are different. You'll have your own means of involving citizens and stakeholders. And we want to enable you to do that and to help you work up those plans. Thanks. Sorry, it was a bit long. Okay, many thanks, Matthew, but uh, the responses are very precise and, and very challenging and exciting and engaging. So thanks very much. So now I will give the floor to two exciting cities as well that have really ambitious commitments. So each of you will have 10 minutes and then we again will have some time for questions and answers at the end. So I'd love to give the floor to our colleague Daniela Meister from Germany, the city of Aachen, and she's climate protection manager in the city administration. So Daniela, you have the floor for 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. So hello from Aachen, everyone. I will just briefly share my screen if possible. So actually I can't share my screen as long as there is another presentation open. Ah, now it's working, okay. Okay, all right. So in the following 10 minutes, I would like to briefly show you what we're doing in Aachen to reach the 2030 target. But first I would like to give you just a short overview on Aachen. It's a, um, a town located at the tri-border region between Germany, Belgium, and Nether the Netherlands. It's known, for example, for its quite old and nice buildings like the Aachen Dome, you can see here on the right side. And it's also a university city. So we have at least five universities in town so among our 250,000 inhabitants, there are many students and also people from all over the world. Um, Aachen is very active in climate protection or climate issues in general since many years. So in 1992, we joined the Climate Alliance. In 2008, we joined the Covenant of Mayors as a signature and we're also part of the Management System European Energy Award since 2009. In the last years, we had three big milestones in mitigation. So in June 2019, we declared the climate emergency as many cities did at this point. And this led to the work on our climate protection concept. I shortened it as uh, IKSK because of its German name. And so, um, yeah, just to make it clear. 
while we were working on this concept, our city council decided to consider the Paris Agreement more detailedly and to um, yeah, declare climate neutrality as a target for 2030. And in, um, in 2020, there was the official resolution in the city council of our climate protection concept. And I would now like to briefly introduce you our, to you our concept. It aims at a 50% reduction from 1990 to 2030. So, um, and to do so, we, yeah, we have an annual reduction, or we plan an annual reduction of 77,000 tons from 2020 to 2030. And to do so, of course, we need measures. We have um, around 70 measures planned for until 2025. Of course, we need money to do so. So we have a budget of 80 million euros for four years. This is 2% of our city's total budget, just to give you an estimate. It might sound as a short number, but actually for just one yeah, key concept, 2% uh, is actually quite a lot. We created 25 new jobs during the last two years because we need people to do so. And um, which is also a very important point. Um, if now measures are proposed to our city council for discussion, every measure has to be evaluated on its impact on climate change because everything is related to climate change, what we are doing. And um, so we are very proud on this um, yeah, evaluation process that we have now because it also raises awareness all over the city administration um, yeah, that everything is related to climate change and that we have to consider it. Our concept has five main action fields, urban development, traffic and mobility, power and energy, construction and facility management, and also um, this part here, management, cooperation, public relations, so um, also stakeholder management. Um, our concept just covers mitigation, as I pointed out here. Of course, it's strongly, strongly related to adaptation, but it's um, treated in its own concept in our town. So we separated it from our concepts. So we had to evaluate our measures and their um, realistic potential for carbon dioxide reduction. In fact, our concept can lead to a reduction of 59% until 2030. So you can see this here in yellow. There are 41% remaining, which doesn't mean that we have no idea what to do with, with this 41%. It's just that for our concept, we need measures that are quantifiable somehow. And in those 41%, there are, for example, measures um, which exist since a very long time, which are not that easy to quantify or which are just in, in planning at the moment. Among our measures, energy and power is by far the largest part. Then we have buildings. So um, in fact, actually building renovation because we have many old buildings here which are not energy efficient, which rely on fossil heating materials, and we need to improve on that. There's this part called other, and um, as I showed you in our five action fields before, this is this whole part of cooperation. Um, for example, projects in schools and projects with citizens, um, yeah, this is covered in this whole part. Mobility and traffic might look a little small here with 2.7%, but I can promise you that mobility is a big deal here in Aachen and that we are strongly working on this part. It's just, again, this um, problem with quantification and um, yeah, the difficulty that as a city with many commuters, it's often hard to quantify mobility in general. And of course, our local economy plays a role in our concepts too. I would be briefly like to give you some examples for our measures. So energy and power, as I said, is the largest action field we have and we are taking renewable energies in focus here. So we offer financial support in a program to our citizens and to the local economy to install solar panels on the roofs, on the balconies, so anywhere where possible. And to motivate everyone, we have an advertisement campaign. So this is one example for our posters that are currently visible in Aachen. You can see here the nice Aachen skyline and uh, yeah, the ideal picture that solar panels are installed everywhere because we really hope to encourage our citizens to um, yeah, install solar panels if possible and to um, yeah, use renewable energy if possible. For building renovation, we also have the same financial support program because it's costly to renovate buildings, but we strongly need to do so. Um, we understand that this is 
Coastly for citizens and often a big project they are working on. So we offer consulting for citizens where they can ask for help and where they get support or also um, get hints for further funding of, for example, the state or um, our federal state. And in the close future, we also plan to have a program for green rooftops. And as you can see here, this is one of the parts where our climate protection concept is, of course, strongly re related to adaptation. Yeah, mobility, as I said, it's um, very important in Aachen to have a mobility transformation because at the moment it's a car friendly city and not really a bike friendly city. So um, we strongly encourage our citizens to leave the car at home or don't even buy one and use bikes, car sharing, public transport and all sorts of alternative mobility if possible. So we have a startup here that offers pedelec sharing, for example. So in some prominent places here in Aachen, you can um, easily yeah, borrow a, pe a pedelec and return it on a different place. Um, electric mobility, I think as everywhere is also important here. Um, we have some electric buses in the inner circle of Aachen already. And what I would really like to stress here, we recently received two hydrogen powered garbage trucks. And as a city administration, we, yeah, we serve kind of as a role model, we think. So we are a very important player in the city and also we take this role very seriously in town here. So we cooperate with the local industry, academia. As I said, we have many universities here. So this is a very strong cooperation partner. We cooperate with citizens and NGOs, but also in our daily work life, we try to be as climate friendly as possible, especially on business trips. So um, yeah, I think as everywhere now, people start to go on business trips again, and we are told to use either public transport or car sharing. But in case we need to go to rural areas, for example, the Eiffel region here, we have the opportunity to borrow cars, like those electric cars here on the right from our employer so that we don't have to buy or use our own car. And also for our daily commuter work, we can um, get commuter tickets to use the public transport. And of course, not only since COVID-19, but strongly promoted by it, we have the opportunity now to work at home a few days a month. And um, this is of course very convenient for my colleagues who have a long distance to work. And so they don't have to use the car every day or the public transport. And um, of course, we try to install solar panels also on our own buildings. Um, yeah, and to yeah, building renovation is of course also an important part here. As I said, while we were working on this concept, our city council decided to yeah set even stronger targets and to become climate neutral by 2030. And um, our climate protection concept, as I said, we yeah we estimate a, a linear reduction from 77,000 tons per year, but if we would do so, our budget would be used up by 2028. So we urgently need an updated concept, and this is what we are strongly working on at the moment. Just to visualize briefly our task, this is where our concept leads us, but at the same time, we need to go to here. So this is now our main task in Aachen and what we are working on, because we want to be climate neutral by 2030, and yeah, we are strongly working on this. So let me briefly sum up. Um, what I would like to keep you in mind, just in the interest of time maybe, is our two financial support programs, because this is what we are really putting a lot of effort in to help and support our citizens to make their homes climate friendly and ready for the future. So I hope I could give you a brief overview on what we are doing in Aachen. I'm happy to answer questions. And if you want to contact us, here is my email address and please feel free to visit our website. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, Daniela. We're uploading in, in the room, okay? So uh, let me share with you the, uh, you know, the, the example you put into this is, uh, is an exciting example. So we'll have some questions uh, after the presentation of our next speakers because I, I even have one for you already, okay? So then I'll give the floor um, to our uh, colleague um, Ivana Petriknik from uh, the city of uh, Slavonski in Croatia. So Ivana, you have the floor also for 10 minutes. Hello everyone, I am Ivana. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, okay, uh, I am working in the city of Slovensky Brod uh, in the Department for Construction, Physical Planning and Environmental Protection. Uh, I don't know, you have my presentation, right? Okay, but I'm not sure about the object. No, where's this? Okay, name of what is logic. But it's okay. We have some technical difficulties. Okay, sorry, we have some technical difficulties. Can you hear me? Yes, okay, so I will be presenting without presentation, so sorry. Okay, uh, I will be telling about uh, how a city of Slavonsky brought uh, preparing to reach the, to, uh, to the 2030 climate target. Uh, the city of Slavonsky brought is the seventh largest city in the Republic of Croatia with uh, 59,000 and 141 uh, residents. Uh, it's located on the back, banks of the Sava River and stretch, stretches uh, on the gentle slopes of Dilgora. Uh, it covers an uh, area of uh, 54.45 square meters. It was built uh, on the site of Romanian Marsonia at the crossroads uh, of the most important international routes connected to the countries of Europe with the Middle East uh, along the border with uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. It's the largest city in Slovenia and Posavina. Our mission is uh, continuously uh, improve the quality of uh, life and work of people in the city of Slavonski Brod. The purpose of entire city uh, administration, uh, city institutions and companies is to develop the city through uh, efficient, timely, rational and above all quality activities. So that Slavonski Brod uh, as a place to live uh, would be pleasant safe and desirable living and working environment. The city administration will uh, strive to enable faster development uh, of the city through the provision of public services, uh, responsible management uh, of public goods and efficient and transparent work to create positive en environment for economic development with the aim of uh, satisfying all residents. Uh, City of Slavonski Brod has adopted uh, several strategic uh, documents in the field of energy, such as uh, Sustainable Energy Action Plan and the Energy Efficiency Action Plan. Uh, we are required to develop a sustainable energy and climate action plan with the aims of cutting CO2 emissions by 55% by 2030 and increasing resilience to climate change. Uh, further, to achieve ambitions, pl ambitions plan, the city of Slavonski Brod successfully applied for a second, of, a second open call of the European city facility. A uh, main objective of the plant uh, investment project is uh, decarbonization, optimization and digitalization of district uh, heating system in the city of Slavonski Brod. In accordance uh, with the adopted strategic documents in the field of energy, this concept will be good basis for uh, aggreg aggregation with the other projects that uh, the city plans to implement, such as energy renewal of the public buildings and increasing the use of renewable energy <coughs> uh, sources. Further, uh, main measure plan, at, uh, plan for the uh, investment, uh, investment projects uh, is uh, integrating low temperature uh, district heating system in the city. The measure will uh, contribute uh, significantly uh, to uh, an efficient use of energy resources and the better integration of renewable energy and sur 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 surplus heat in the 
existing uh, district heating system. Uh, expected, expect impacts of the investment projects are energy savings, uh, 112 uh, gigawatt hour per, per year, and the renewable energy production, uh, 300 gigawatt uh, hour per year. Foreseen activities to develop the investment concept within uh, Europe and sitting facility are uh, establishment of the working group and organization of two working group meetings, uh, mapping, mapping of current demand and supply, renewable potentials, uh, quantitative assignment of different options uh, for reducing emissions, and development of thematic analysis such as uh, engineering, market, uh, deeper economic, financial, and analysis of possible sources. Uh, also for, in, uh, for the implementation of investment concept, we are already in the partnership uh, with uh, Broadclean LTD as a local utility company. Main output of this project uh, will uh, demonstrate an uh, innovative and efficient approach in designing investment con concept, which can be easily reused in other cities with uh, existing system but also in the cities uh, that have a measure for development uh, of district heating system in plan. In accordance with the uh, adopted and future such strategic documents in the field of energy, this concept will be a good basis for grouping with other projects uh, that the city of Slavonski brought plans to implement, such as um, uh, energy grouping, uh, recovery of renewal, energy renewal of public buildings, uh, increasing uh, the use of uh, renewable energy sources, development of alternative fuel infrastructure, uh, modernization of public lighting system, and increasing green uh, infrastructure. Also, by implementing these projects, uh, the city of Slavonski Brod will take uh, a key step towards achieving uh, climate uh, naturality, natu naturality uh, as strategic goal of the European Union. Uh, city of Slavonski Brod will reduce 55% uh, of uh, greenhouse gas emission by 2030 and 80% of gig, uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. According to that, by 2050, we will be living in decarbonized and resilient city with access to affordable, secure, and sustainable energy. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Ivana. Also, very exciting and very ambitious. So I would like to, so I wish you a lot of luck to both of you, Daniela and Ivana. I would have one immediate question after listening to you, and is how, because you have set a very ambitious plans, targets, and commitments, so that's impressive. But in order to do that, you also need to have citizens on board. So how are you planning to do that? Because one thing is the political, is, is the, the political commitment, so you can have the commitment of the mayor and that's really the obligatory that's out of the question but how do you intend um, to involve citizens because the commitment cannot work if you don't have people on board and, and as uh, Matthew was saying it's not something that you're doing to them it's something that you're doing with them and for them so how do you both cities how do you intend to to have the citizens on board to make this uh, a success and, and in the long run because we we are all setting targets for 250 so we need to keep uh, what rolling and for a, a few more years. So how do you plan this? And what challenges do you see in, in your strategies now? So thank you. And of course, Eva and Matthew can also react to, to that as well, if they wish. Thank you. Okay, cool. Who will answer first? Uh, you have the floor now, Ivana, you can, you can react to that. Oh gosh. Um, Okay, my colleague, uh, my colleague will answer this question. Thank you. My name is Irena Matkovic. Sorry, I was not here earlier. I was busy. 
Um, well, uh, we think the, uh, the main thing is education. Without that, our residents will never truly understand what is going on with the climate change and uh, how they can help. Also, um, and how to involve uh, in climate change. Uh, also, we have uh, of in the final stage of a smart city strategy for Slavonski Broad. And our plan is to uh, financial support for solar panels for citizens uh, and for public uh, buildings, green, top roof, green rooftops, mobility transformation, alternative clean transport, gasification, even more for a residential building, education, of course, energy efficient building, lightning, energy renovated, new river transport, and so much. Uh, so other plans, yes, other plans too. Thank you very much as well. And uh, Daniela, what about in Aachen? Um, yeah, in Aachen, so at the moment we have um, our advertisement campaigns for our two um, yeah, funding initiatives or uh, financial support programs. They involve also the dialogue with citizens. So for example, we now have um, for the second time next week, we will be in the, at our local marketplace uh, and yeah, we'll be ready for dialogue there. So we try to inform our citizens there why they are shopping, they can come over and ask questions. And, also, we have, um, I don't know how to call it, it's um, some kind of school program for um, people not being at school, so they can book courses here at, in the evening. And there we also have some information events also with um, NGOs and um, some consulting initiatives. So it's really hard to translate it into English because it's uh, very German words. Um, so we try to inform the citizens with the help of local NGOs and local groups. So this is also, um, some indirect contact to the citizens. And um, yeah, education uh, was also a good point. So we have a prog program um, at the moment in the process to go to schools and to inform kids, parents, teachers, to inform them and get involved on energy saving, sustainability, and so on. And um, yeah, in general, cooperating with citizens is now a big topic since we have a new mayor in town. So this is all at the moment now in progress and I'm very excited how this will turn out in the future. Thanks very much to both of you, Daniela and Ivan. I think that with uh, officials like you, you know, the, it will be a success by any means. So I know that Matthew wanted to react as well. So Matthew, please well, say hi. It's so interesting to hear. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Sorry. Thank you very much to both of you. That was fascinating to hear the specific plans you've got for engaging citizens, which I'm hearing everywhere is so important. To replay something I hear from other cities, what um, they tell me is that their citizens react, particularly when they hear about lower energy bills or um, less congestion or better air quality for the children. Um, uh, because in a way, it's hard to sell climate neutrality on its own, because if Aachen or Slavonsky Brod are the only places to do it, it won't make any difference. And that's, so you have this uh, sort of tragedy of the common. So um, what I'm hearing from other cities is sell the other, the co-benefits as well, and then people really get it and, and move along. Does, is that, does that fit with your own experience? Or not so much? Is it people drawn to the big global objective that, that actually gets people on board? Uh, can you please uh, repeat the question? Sorry. Sure. Um, it's, I'm sorry, I probably spoke too quickly. It's about what I call the co-benefits. So if you act on climate neutrality, you get better air quality. Mm -hmm. You get less traffic congestion, you have more energy uh, security and maybe lower energy bills. So in other words, the co-benefits of action to deliver climate neutrality bring the most tangible, tangible benefits to citizens and to the young people. So my question was, do you find it easy to sell your initiatives on those issues or is it the big <laughs> global commitment that we have to tackle climate neutrality that gets people going, particularly the young people? Uh, I think it's the second one. Second one is the global. 
uh, activity because I don't know, this is a really uh, interesting how you think about young people because um, because of uh, price of uh, election, electricity and everything. Uh, so yeah, we are doing like uh, everything uh, in the pet because this is global problem. We didn't think about that like you. I also agree to this. It's the same here. It's um, mainly the global pro um, problem. But um, of course, there are some which are interested in the co-benefits, but we experience both actually here. Okay, thank you very much. Would you like to react uh, on, on that, uh, Ed, on, on these points? Okay. Working now. It's working. Yes. Okay. Great. So um, I, I think it was interesting to hear what what you gave us uh, as the answer. Uh, uh, both of you actually. I I would have expected the co benefits to to drive it more, but mm. but this could also be the um, this kind of also Greta Thunberg uh, effect a little bit, and the yes. um, and and indeed I would say younger generation, you know, caring about the global global aspect a lot because that's uh, I think it's great you know but uh, I always thought myself that it would be more driven by these kinds of like day-to-day -day things but that's probably applies more to my to my mother then uh, who is 80, uh, 88 years old so uh, it's it could be a bit of a generational generational issue or then cultural mm. Mm. okay thanks <laughs> okay are there any additional questions? Because I also have something on the financing side, which is always something that comes on, on every political agenda or any technical agenda is where is the money? So since you have very ambitious targets, do you foresee some kind of stability in, in finding these resources? Because also the, the political cycle changes. So sometimes it depends very much on whether the mayor is more supportive of the climate agenda or less climate and climate uh, mitigation and adaptation on I mean, or a bit less supportive. So do you foresee, you know, like a stable and sustainable financing strategy in up to 230? To, I mean, up to 230, you already have plans, but up to 250. Maybe it may be some preparation, so no, no problem. This is just a very challenging aspect. Um, I am I'm not sure how to answer this question. So as I said, we have a budget until 2025. And I think this is quite sure, but actually um, since I was one of the 25 jobs that were created, I'm just uh, at the city of Aachen since 11 months. So I'm still learning on it. And um, yeah, I, I now I, if I have to guess, I think climate change is very important, especially here in Aachen, since we experienced those drastic floodings um, in July, I think it will be a topic during the next years for sure. Brilliant, thank you. And good luck in the new position as well. <laughs> Very challenging. Okay. And Ivana wanted to react? Uh, okay, well, it's the same for us too uh, in the Croatia because we are uh, large, the largest city in Slavonia and Posavina, but uh, I don't know. <laughs> this is really complicated question. Um, I'm I'm working here in the city like wow, two months, and uh, so yeah, I don't know what to say <laughs> about this because we are not ready. We don't. We, we are we always rely on EU funds, I can say like that for now. Okay, thanks. I mean, is is it really a huge challenge? So you still have a few years to think about that. And I think that the fact that you have new positions that also gives you the, the beauty to design to you know the, the, the strategy for the upcoming years. And Matthew wanted to react quickly. Uh, well, yes, I mean you're right, Ava. We, you know, if 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 you're not going for 2030, you do have a few years. But if you're going for 2030, the time 
is now. And, and so uh, I'd really, um, I mean, I'm not able to say you're in the mission, but I'd very much invite uh, Grad Slovinsky and, and, and of course Aachen to think about joining the mission for the precisely some help on those financing aspects. We know that all the money can't come from EU funds or national funds or indeed city funds. We estimate that the cost of going to climate neutrality is around a billion euros for an, a city an average population size of 100,000. And I know a Slovensky probably is a bit smaller than that and Aachen's a bit bigger than that, but that's a significant sum of money. And therefore we need to think together with you and the cities, how best to tap into the capital markets for that. It's not easy. Uh, it's a complex, complicated business. But again, I'm really confident there's a lot of money out there. And the question is how we find the right capital market instrument with you to tap into those funds. So uh, very interested to continue these discussions with you. Many thanks, Matthew. <laughs> so um, I'm going to um, just mention some takeaways. But before I do that, I would like to ask you to put your cameras on for a quick uh, picture, um, if, if, if I may. <laughs> if you want to have it, it's not, it's not compulsory. <laughs> OK, but if we can maybe just take a quick shot. Okay. Okay, we can take this, okay. So, okay, shy, shy people behind the screens, but it's not a problem. I mean, those who want to show yourself, no problem. Some, some of you don't have a camera, so no problem. So, Pedro, can you take one? Okay, so one, two, three. Once more, one, two, three. And you have it, okay. Thank you very much. So just my main takeaways I would like to retain from this session very quickly so we can finish on time is that we have now seen that we have all of us, these communities around the table, around the screen, okay? Hopefully physically again. And this was also said this morning at the um, Covenant of Mayor ceremony, all the institutions mentioned this, and also the public, you know, community is the word that came in the cloud if you were present there. We also have seen that with this climate emergency, we're turning this into an opportunity. It's not, a, we don't see this more as any problem. We see it as an opportunity to become stronger and to become more resilient. And also this will help us reach the decarbonization target for 250, with of course the intermediate target of 230, the ambitious one for which we need uh, funding and commitment. This is also a huge opportunity for recovery, but also for involvement of the citizens. And as Matthew said, it's now something we need to do to them. It's something we need to build with the citizens and for the citizens. So the, the closer we are with them and to them, the better resource we will get. Also, we need to make sure that we use the right vocabulary and the right language with them. They, they need to understand what this means to them. And if we talk about bills, they will maybe take more action and quicker. If we take about very complicated and complex issues, they might not take action. So make sure all of us that we really show examples that people can see. And also the young generations, they have a huge challenge ahead of that and a big responsibility. You can change the world. So I invite you to do it so. And then the uh, last point is that we also need to show our success. And we've seen what white Europe is really the leading continent. And we, we have you know, in the global covenant of mayors of which the European covenant was the founding covenant. It, it's just a, a practice and initiative that is now worldwide. Everyone knows about this. And then we the, the most important thing is not the numbers. It's just that we can show examples that work. And also it's good to learn from those practices that have not worked in the past because that will save us time and money in the future. It's not only sharing best practices, it's also sharing practices, bad practices or mistakes we've done in the past so we can really learn from that and see what else can be uh, better for the future. And then also it's very important to include all types of cities, big cities, small cities, medium-sized cities, and establish this peer review and an exchange among them. So the covenant is also a community where the networking is, is very uh, clear and obvious, is very accessible to all of you. So I really want to thank all the participants and all our speakers, so Edo and uh, Matthew, Ivana and Daniela, and also my uh, colleagues in the office, uh, Lola, Pedro, and uh, from the office of the covenant, uh, Florian Mitley, for your technical support and content uh, support as well. And I really wish you a very fruitful um, path towards 230, 240, and 250, and mainly a good afternoon. <laughs> so thank you very much, and see you hopefully very soon.
uh, in Brussels and somewhere else. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.